Williams is the great fallen giant of Formula 1, with its 16 world championships and 114 victories a fading memory. But there is hope as the sale to American investment company Doralton Capital in August last year has triggered the biggest changes at Williams since it was formed at the start of 1977. For years, Williams has fiercely protected its own independence, whether that was refusing to sell out to BMW in the mid-noughties, fighting against customer cars or railing against B-teams. But it has now made the big decision to soften its position, announcing that its gearbox and hydraulic systems will be supplied by Mercedes from 2022 onwards. Realistically, this is probably a bullet Williams needed to bite a few years ago, but it's better late than never. It might seem irreconcilable with its desire to avoid becoming a B-team, but there is a middle ground to be struck, and this is a logical conclusion that best serves the team's circumstances and ambitions. The benefits of Mercedes parts First and foremost, Williams can be sure of quality. Mercedes components are tried and tested race winners, so this is a low-risk move for Williams, as running technology from the preeminent team of the age cannot be bad. That's not to say the quality of the Williams gearbox and hydraulics were holding the team back, even if it was the last team to run an aluminium rather than carbon casing. After all, the gearbox and hydraulics are not hugely performance sensitive in terms of the differences across the current grid. Even if Williams produced the best gearbox and hydraulics package, this would not transform its fortunes. But by choosing this path, the team no longer has to worry about these parts and can focus elsewhere. In effect, it is forsaking being comfortably the smallest of those attempting to be big teams to take on its direct competitors on a more level playing field. It does come at a cost, and not just a financial one. Firstly, it means your capacity to produce gearboxes and hydraulics in the future lies fallow, but this can always be restarted down the line, in a distant, hoped-for future where Williams is thinking about fighting for championships once again. Secondly, by taking a customer gearbox, you are compromised in terms of your rear suspension design freedom, packaging and your technical horizons are limited. But having to follow the Mercedes path is no bad thing, and just because you do that, it doesn't mean you're going down the extreme racing point route and copying a car. For proof of that, just look at the many years Racing Point had a Mercedes technical partnership, but a very different car concept closer to the high-rate Red Bull approach. What it does allow Williams to do is to take personnel who would otherwise be working on the gearbox and hydraulics and redeploy them elsewhere. This is the critical point, because it means a team that is still resource limited can channel its efforts into areas that make a bigger difference. For a smaller team, even one with a decent level of investment from its new owners, this is a pragmatic solution. By taking the Mercedes rear end, especially if they're also taking the suspension, which is unclear at this stage, Williams is ticking several big boxes when it comes to the complex challenge of the 2022 car. This will be an all-new car with almost no carryover, making it an enormous project. So even if being a customer limits its design input in some areas, there's more than enough to concentrate on elsewhere. This is an obvious but necessary move for Williams that proves idealism is taking a backseat to realism. Finally taking the plunge on a wider ranging technical partnership with Mercedes is further evidence that there could be a brighter future ahead rather than just another false dawn, even if it is just one of a great many decisions that must be nailed if a return to race winning form is ever to happen. Management changes Doralton Capital's takeover led to the departure of the Williams family last September, most significantly team principal Frank Williams and his daughter, deputy team principal and de facto team boss Claire Williams. CEO Mike O'Driscoll also headed into retirement after assisting with the transition. Simon Roberts, who originally joined the team last June as managing director F1, is now team principal, having initially been given the job on a temporary basis. But the most important change is the recruitment of Jos Capito, who will start work as Williams CEO on February the 1st. Capito is the main man, and Roberts reports to him. 
Capito has a wealth of motorsport experience, including leading Volkswagen's domination of the World Rally Championship from 2013 to 2016, as well as stints at Ford, Porsche and Sauber. But he's best known in F1 for leaving McLaren just five months after joining in 2016 to lead its racing operation. At McLaren, Capito was a victim of the power struggle that ultimately led Ron Dennis, who recruited him, being ousted. But he had already identified key weaknesses and improvements that needed to be made, ones that are known to have met the enthusiastic approval of many on the shop floor. But McLaren was not yet ready to be honest with itself about the extent of the problem, and Capito never had the chance to fix the fundamentally flawed structure and culture. Since then, many of the problem areas Capito identified have been tackled by McLaren anyway, proving he had the right idea. Williams is in an even worse position than McLaren was then, but given it hasn't won a championship since 1997, it's certainly better prepared to harness his talents. Finishing last in the championship for three consecutive years and winning just one race in 16 seasons means the team cannot fail to lack humility. Under the non-interventionalist ownership of Doralson Capital, which stresses stability and long-term strategy, Capito should have the chance to work its magic. He may ruffle a few feathers along the way, because undergoing change is never an easy process, but Williams needs the injection of passion, vision and clear leadership he offers. Is it still Williams? While some have lamented the loss of the old Williams thanks to the changes, the team's long-term strategy retains many of the cultural improvements identified by former boss Claire Williams, as well as the same staff, headquarters and ethos. The difference now is it has the financial resources to implement them, even if it's under different leadership that will also introduce new ideas. The initial outline of the Doralton strategy was to prioritise long-term performance and be ready for the arrival of F1's new technical regulations in 2022, while also evaluating how to deploy newly available cash in the short term. But while the sale had no discernible impact on 2020 on track, save for ensuring a more healthy spare supply, it will start to have an effect this year. The initial priority was to clear Williams's debts with a cash injection of £42.5 million before moving on to the second phase of development. In late November, a further £5 million was invested for working capital purposes and proves the desire to fund the direction the team was already heading in. The culture of working at Williams was something that had been under review since early last year, after the significant disappointment of 2018 had given way to an abysmal and late 2019 car. A lot of the changes were made as a result of this, improving planning and production processes to address the difference between where Williams had fallen to and the requirements of a modern, successful F1 team. That process was therefore underway long before Doralton's arrival, which is partly why Williams was able to progress from an average performance deficit of 4.3% in 2019 to 2.8% in 2020. The cash injection has been used to refurbish or replace existing infrastructure where required throughout the factory. The upgrades were completed before the start of 2021, so crucially before the cost gap kicked in. Connected to this is the desire to improve efficiency, hence the expanded technical partnership with Mercedes. As Robert said last year, we don't want to become a B team. But inefficiency is the enemy in maximising its potential. That pragmatic approach will serve the team well. It's not going to be a quick turnaround for Williams, and 2021 is set to be another year toiling towards the back of the field but the foundations are being put in place that means its future should be brighter, even if years of underinvestment will take time to fix. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up and also let us know what you expect from Williams this year in the comments below. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss anything from the race.